So uh, I'm not going to be presenting you with, uh, with anything in the way of data today. This is more of a sort of general chat because I know that uh, one of the most important courses that um, uh, educational supervisors do uh, in the Mersey Deanery is the Certificate of Medical Education and above that uh, you run here from Edge Hill. So I thought it'd be more appropriate to talk about uh, education matters rather than, um, rather than incontinence, which might not have appealed to all of you in the audience. So. Those are a few little things that we're going to cover in this particular talk. So we'll start in what I've put there as the good old days. Um, they were fantastic days, weren't they? I've just been reminded what I was like as a houseman. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I, I knew that from my time as a research registrar that would be something new. new. Um, but in, when, when, I was, when I were a houseman, <laughs> or, or, as, or even from medical school, I'm not sure that there was nef necessarily a defined curriculum that we were following. We just uh, turned up, did the job, and uh, said, people said, probably said you were all right. Most of, the, most of the jobs at the different levels often were sort of based in one hospital uh, rather than uh, uh, sort of an, an, an organized training program. The training was quite long in many specialties. Uh, if you wanted to become a surgeon, then you knew that you were probably going to be halfway through your career before you got to the consultant post. There weren't many signposts along the way as to what's the right direction to go in this travel and you may have ended up in a dead end and not actually got uh, to where you were trying to get to in the first place. There was certainly an apprenticeship element to it. Uh, I don't think there was any feedback really. Uh, um, long hours, very long hours, not as busy as, it, as, as now. But, um, one could never imagine how the, the numbers of people coming into hospitals is just going up and up and up, uh, which is a, a real challenge because of the, the, the conflict there between the service and the, and the training. And most of us, we, we sort of recognised that you probably needed to get something extra into your CV if you're going to make yourself a good candidate for the plum jobs. And doing a research degree was uh, certainly viewed as being a good thing then. Uh, that has changed a lot in many of the specialties where um, just uh, being able to turn up is, is enough because uh, many interview committees for consultants posts will be delighted that they've actually got somebody that's turning up for the interview and that they might even be appointable. So the idea of competition, but that we do have other specialties uh, which are very competitive and a background of, uh, of doing extra things will, will be important. Um, when I was rumbling through some stuff and I moved office, I found a bit of paper which I thought, oh, I didn't realise I got a, a CCT, but I think that's what they gave us when the Calmanisation of training came in and those of us that were already consultants got given one uh, as, we, as they started off the specialist register. Training records they certainly didn't exist when we were uh, going through the ranks. Uh, that that came more, came in the um, sort of the 80s and 90s, more the 90s. But when they were training records, it was mostly could you do the procedures? Had you done enough of them? Could you actually do that operation? Could you do that medical procedure? We did actually uh, have the development of general professional training in the medical specialties, such that. Uh, uh, SHO jobs were expected to be able to provide a, a, a decent level of general training so that you were then c competent to go forward into the, uh, uh, into the registrar level of work. The Royal Colleges of, of Physicians had a job of inspecting SHO posts and other colleges similarly had that role which was view viewed as very, very important and colleges would still like to be doing that now today but you'll hear later that, that uh, that's no longer uh, viewed as, as, as something that's their role. Uh, quality management has very much taken on the role of being a deanery activity or the, the regulator. And the curricula started to be written. The first few uh, f f versions of that were nothing like as decent as the ones that I, th I believe that our trainee is now working towards. So when I, when I was a houseman, it was six months six of uh, both medicine and surgery. Nowadays, there's only a requirement to do at least four months of each of those specialties. Um, there are still jobs that provide six months of each. Uh, in the hospital that, uh, that I organise the, uh, the, the foundation programme in, um, we, most of our trainees do eight months of medicine and four months of surgery. Um, and, but that, that surgical uh, experience might be in any of the different surgical specialties. When I got my house job, I remember it was a case of going along and asking somebody, could I work with them? And they, they said, yes. And then you turned up on the first day and you, you started working. But, and there wasn't, there wasn't educational supervision, there certainly wasn't what I would regard as an induction. Um, I don't think there was mentorship at that time, but that's, uh, that, that has been sort of developing. 
But after that house job, we applied for our SHO job, but it was a, a different job every year. You had to apply for it every year. Then you get your registrar job, which might have been for a bit longer. They might have been in just one hospital, but the, there was the beginnings in the, uh, of some rotations, but that, of course, at that time was not connected with the senior registrar post. Um, so there was lots and lots of uh, application processes. But eventually uh, SHO rotations inside hospitals happen, so you may get attached to a hospital for a couple of years and rotate through a number of specialties. But most of those rotations were for six months, and I always felt that months five and six of a six-month post in the medical specialty was actually a bit of a waste of time because you'd probably learnt the main messages and then you probably needed to move on to the next one at SHO level to learn a different set of experiences. But if um, I know there's at least one surgeon in the, the audience, that is not the case in the surgical specialties where that experience of doing the, the practical procedures is, is vitally important and you need to build up that, that the last couple, those extra couple of months make a big difference in what people are able to do in the surgical specialties. And that's quite important to me because one of my little ones is actually a budding surgeon at the moment and going through that level of training and they still stick to six month posts. The world has been gradually developing, particularly during the last decade, and Mersey was one of the places where the Foundation Year 2 pilots uh, uh, were conducted, and in, I, I was quite heavily involved with, with setting up the first of those pilots, uh, which included our hospital, where we took some of our SHO jobs uh, and made a, a, a group of three four-month posts in a variety of different specialties, uh, which was followed on with then with the Foundation curriculum, and now all of our foundation doctors will tend to, will have a, 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 an F1 and an F2 experience working to the foundation curriculum which is based on generic skills, looking after acutely unwell patients, uh, dealing with the foundation procedures which most of them are coming from medical school already able to do but just having that verified and the foundation curriculum did bring in for foundation doctors a portfolio to record their educational meetings, the workplace assessments, record the reflection ensure they've written a personal development plan. So it was actually very disappointing when I did an ARCP this morning to find that a, an ST4 trainee in paediatric cardiology didn't actually know what a personal development plan should look like. He thought it was actually just recording what he'd done in the last year. And I thought, oh gosh, <laughs> but that, hey ho. But um, other developments that have happened around foundation training include national recruitment to foundation year one. Um, I've. Fortunately, what I refer to as the creative writing test has actually now come to an end because uh, it's actually fairly mind-blowing to read through uh, those. But we actually, this year is the first year in which a situational judgment test, which has been used in GP recruitment for some time, is actually being used for all uh, people leaving medical school who want to start their foundation year one post in August 2013, that they will, they will actually do this situational judgment test which will give them a national ranking, which then uh, the allocation of posts will, will be decided on where they rank. And in Mersey, we actually, uh, uh, in the past, we were, we were undersubscribed numbers-wise for people doing their foundation year one in Mersey. So we've been a net benefiter from national recruitment. Uh, and we actually, generally speaking, have excellent doctors that uh, are, uh, are recruited through that method. It is not only open to UK graduates, anyone from Europe or from elsewhere in the world can, can apply into these posts as well, which has been a bit of an anxiety as to whether that would in adversely affect um, our medical students graduating from UK universities, but it hasn't actually turned out to be a problem so far. Um, but, uh, and hopefully it will stay that way, although we are beginning to see a little bit of a uh, of migration away from some of the uh, uh, European countries that are experiencing financial problems, that the number of applicants from Greece has definitely gone up, but the number of applicants from India has almost disappeared. Um, so whereas in the past, if we put out an advert for an F1 job in our hospital, I'd have to sift through 1,000 applications. Nowadays, we don't have anything like that number. Um, the foundation program also was very good for our hospitals in that it allowed the number of training jobs to actually increase because we needed a, some extra jobs in between the, the core training which now exists and the foundation year one um, so that uh, hospitals that were savvy and switched on could actually use that as an opportunity to put in a lot more training posts into their, in their hospitals and that 
So in, in Wirral we went from uh, being one of the worst doctored hospitals in the whole of the UK to actually being viewed as not bad now, but some of the other trusts which didn't see the opportunity uh, are now struggling with the consequences of the increasing number of patients coming in and not very many doctors in training posts. And the further you are away from Liverpool, the harder it is because that's um, uh, I in the Mersey Deanery because uh, the, the doctors in there appointed to Mersey think I'm going to work in Liverpool, not necessarily in Crewe. The other good thing about the foundation programme is the dedicated teaching time and virtually all of our trusts uh, in their foundation year two will have a half day set aside every week for the foundation year two doctors to, to learn together and that teaching programme is, is based on the, on the curriculum that's not quite as good for the doctors at all the other levels. But my sort of main work has been around the medical specialties. So we had uh, um, in the mid 2000s, we had a number of hospitals which had reasonably good SHO rotations, um, but th they all differed in what they were able to offer. But we uh, initially about half of the trusts are, merged together their SHO rotations into a, a basic medical training scheme which that later then became the, uh, the core medical training scheme. And I uh, uh, looked at the, the portfolio of stuff that was available either from the tra training record which already existed for the, uh, from the College of Physicians for SHOs or from the foundation pilot. And I, the stuff that was in the foundation portfolio I didn't particularly like, but other bits that I did. So we actually put them into a paper-based record, uh, which we used for the first year of our basic medical training. We were then approached by uh, um, the Royal College of Physicians to pilot the, uh, the, the, um, the usefulness of the, of the proposed core medical training curriculum uh, with our, with our uh, scheme and we were asked to move our paper portfolio into an electronic portfolio, uh, which was also happening at the same time for the foundation doctors. So the curricula, which uh, uh, this is the front cover of one of them in 2007, had actually moved on and developed things from the 2003 version of the curricula, and anything that was pre-2003 wasn't really worth talking about. At that stage, we had a separate generic curriculum for all the medical specialties, and then there was a curriculum for all the individual specialties thereafter. An exercise which I'm glad that I wasn't involved with was blueprinting all the competencies that were in the curriculum against the assessment methodology. Unfortunately, this has now been abandoned as, uh, as or abandoned in the way that it was written, because that, that, uh, that little table there is actually um, a, a gross underrepresentation of it because there were in the GIM CMT curricula there would have been about three or four hundred rows of competencies and about uh, 10, to f 10 to 20 different columns of different assessment methodologies. Uh, so this was a mind-boggling row of, of dots which was of no practical use to anyone but uh, it was a the PMET B at that time who were the regulators were expecting that uh, to be produced for every curriculum. At the same time, we had this going on, which was modernising medical careers and that word MTAS, which uh, scarred a lot of doctors at that time. Um, there was a bad panic going on. If I don't get into a specialty training scheme now, I'll never get into it. I'm going to end up on the scrap heap, which was rubbish. But the, the actual uh, computer system didn't work very well. We had doctors on the street protesting. We had colleges of uh, college presidents saying, oh, this is terrible. The government were given a hard time. Uh, but from that, but at that time, it was it was run through. So you entered at, after your foundation program, you were going to enter a run through in one of these tracks. But for medicine, that you entered through the core medical training in medical medicine in general, and then you had a number of different directions you could go. So we actually had to invent a system right at the end of or towards the end of their two years of core medical training. How are we going to actually allocate them into uh, into their different specialties? So this was uh, this was the outline of training into that new specialty, which which started to grow at that time of uh, of acute medicine, now known as acute internal medicine, where the selection was after the foundation program. But there, and for some of the specialties such as paediatrics, this is still the case that after your foundation program you get selected into your specialty training and you follow that all the way through to you until you get your CCT. In the medical specialties, the two years of, uh, of, um, of core training were in that level one. 
where you'd followed the GIM and the generic curriculum, and then you'd, you'd actually get allocated into a specialty. And most of our doctors actually do, were satisfied with what they were allocated into, and their careers have gone perfectly okay. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite the same as it had been in previous years. Um, but, but, and that, that was one of the things that the, uh, the, the, the world of medicine was very upset about. Because the other big thing was that the main exam that we have as part of the, of the curriculum and the knowledge test for the general internal medicine curriculum, which includes core medical training, was MRCP. And whereas in the past, people had actually had to get MRCP to get from that stage to there, that, that hurdle was lowered. So we had people that were allowed to start their registrar jobs without having, done, having completed the MRCP. Most of them that hadn't completed that time did actually then subsequently go on and get it, but we, even now there are still some of the hang remnants from that. Uh, some girls that have, have had uh, children and have had uh, problems with the exam as well, that it hasn't actually completely run its whole course yet. But more about that in a, in a bit. Um, they say, yeah, when, literally, the, f the decision aid that we drew up at that time this is a, one of the original slides from the pilot we thought if, if people are going to be working this curriculum we actually need to make it explicit what targets you've got to achieve by different stages of your tra training and that's the time we were still on the readers but uh, modernizing medical career brought in the the ARCP which is the annual review of competence progression but one day on, in the basement of the Royal College of Physicians myself and a few others on the back of an envelope literally drew up an initial scheme of how, how, what, what sort of targets would we expect. Um, so I haven't given the detail in that slide, but that, uh, that sort of layout um, uh, has endured. It's been modified and there's a lot more detail on some of these now. But the trainees definitely want to know, what have I got to achieve by a certain length of time? Because if you're going to ju judge people's t progress, then if you don't give them any signposts or, or targets to achieve, then they won't necessarily know if they're getting there. In, in the pilot, the, uh, the, the trainees very much uh, valued the, the curriculum as a way of being able to focus their learning, uh, whereas I don't think <coughs> before, the, before the middle of the 2000s there was any sort of recognition that the curriculum was uh, of any importance whatsoever. Nowadays it is, although to be fair, I think most people still concentrate on the syllabus element of it rather than the actual curric full curriculum, but uh, those of us that are involved in writing and modifying them, we do uh, look at the, the full content. The assessment forms, because uh, workplace assessments were brought, brought in both for foundation and more particularly for core medical training, they, they actually did exist for the medical specialties before, but they're all paper versions. We now move them onto electronic versions, try to simplify them. And work that we're doing at the moment is actually simplifying them even further to take away the tick boxy element of, of the whole process. The things the trainees value most of all was the feedback from their supervisors about how they're getting on. But even now I think we still have quite a lot of variability in how good supervisors are at uh, supporting their trainees, giving them feedback, giving them useful feedback, and that, that the, the way that workplace assessments are done and some of the assessors, they, their idea of feedback is, uh, is, 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 can be summarised in the number of words that they use in the feedback. Um, the worst ones can feed back in three words. The best ones actually give more useful, meaningful feedback, which is what we've been trying to promote. Uh, uh, pr appraisals, posit that, uh, that f encourage, well, not just encouraging, but really forcing supervisors and trainees to have regular discussions and meetings uh, using the personal development plan as central to the process, very important. Um, the, the trainees, well, uh, in there I've said they, they they, um, they found the portfolio easier. I think there's a learning curve with everyone that moves on to an electronic portfolio system of actually understanding it and, and viewing it as not a, b a burden, but something there to support their education and learning. Um, we still have <coughs> trainees today that moan about it, uh, and, but we're trying all the time to make that a, a better process. And from doing the pilot, I've remained as the national lead for the portfolio for medical trainees. Um, and I've had some horrible meetings where uh, in the room you can be attacked by lots and lots of people moaning about the portfolio and some of the problems. But some of the problems of it are actually trying to use it in the NHS. 
um, because the NHS's IT system uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Because you've got a port we've got a portfolio that's designed to work on the most up-to-date versions of software. But what does the NHS use? Internet Explorer 6. And it, it, a lot of the things fall over because the, the software is so old and it's, it works on the internet. So how, big, how wide is the, uh, is the connection of the internet? Is it massively wide? No, it's minute. And don't try to use it in the NHS at lunchtime because it just grinds to a halt. Um, and there's firewalls and all sorts of other technical problems. Um, but it, during that uh, uh, pilot, there was lots and lots of anxiety about the selection process. When we were going around the country on our road show, preparing the rest of the UK to actually uh, uh, implement uh, core medical training, we had to always deal with uh, the MTAS stuff that was going on at the same time. So that, these are some of the screenshots from the original version of the portfolio, which was written in a pretty old uh, computing language and since subsequently been updated. But uh, in, our, in our appraisal forms, we were actually encouraging people to think about the curriculum competencies and what they were going to do. You might say that actually duplicates what's in the personal development plan, but we were certainly wanted it laid out in the personal development plan as well. This was our layout at that time of the, the workplace-based assessments. So we had the mini CXs, the DOPs, the case-based discussions. At that time, we called one uh, a, a new assessment that we drew up at that time of the, we called it ATAT then, acute take tool, but it's now called the ACAT, which was uh, conceived between um, myself, uh, Mike Jones in Edinburgh, Gavin Johnson in London, and it was, uh, it's, it's actually proved to be one of the most useful workplace assessments for, for trainees that are doing acute work, because they actually, it, their skills looking at patients um, during a, a period <coughs> of busy work when they're looking at multiple patients and how they perform in that environment. Uh, and of all the workplace assessments, that's the one that's very gratifying. People talk about with the, with the greatest um, sort of positivity. The one that's not appearing on that list is our multi-source feedback, but I'll show you uh, some of the feedback we get from that in, the, in a bit. So our, we've got our workplace assessment forms, um, encouraging appraisals. So two th August 2007 is when the run-through tr training started. PMET-B were our regulators at that time, but they've now uh, been subsumed into the GMC. Um, the deaneries, from a quality management point of view, ha were the, the primary, their primary responsibilities around setting up the programmes and quality managing the programmes. So uh, it was around about that time that deanery specialty schools started. So the, the, the Mersey Deanery School of Medicine hasn't been there since Dick Dot. I mean, there were programme directors for the different specialties. There was the dean and, uh, and, and his helpers, but there's this new layer of heads of school came in. At that time, I wasn't the head of school, but I was doing the work with someone, it's a, it's a guy you might have heard of, Ian Gilmore, was our original head of school. He, had a, he, went, he left and went on to another job, which you might the president of the college. <laughs> John Dawson did it for a while uh, with me sort of dep as deputy to both of them. Then I, I took it on uh, up just about two years ago now. In 2007, the Pro Medical Programme Board was set up to actually look at those, all the issues about recruitment that had come uh, from the MTAS debacle. And one of the consequences of that is that 2008 onwards, um, the College of Physicians took the lead for national recruitment into core medical training. Um, they, that has carried on since, and other medical specialties have been added on to that recruitment process. Um, the portfolio changed into another version. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit from the recruitment site in a, in a minute. 2009 saw a complete revision of the, uh, of the curricula, particularly for general internal medicine and for, uh, for acute, acute internal medicine. And the, uh, the biggest change that happened at that time is that the run-through got abolished. So we um, because in the, in the 2007 change, we'd gone from having people would train in, say, general medicine and a specialty, and they were then just going to get a CCT in their specialty, and the trainees that were in the system didn't like the idea of that. So we actually then came to this model of training, in that uh, the selection again after the foundation programme, 
We have, in medicine, we have a discrete period of core medical training. The same also happened for the surgeons um, and some of the other specialties, but uh, say there's, we've got a mixed economy where the likes of paediatrics have stuck with, um, with, with a run-through arrangement. But the exam now is, a, is a, an exit requirement from core medical training, which is where physicians always wanted it to be. And we have, uh, uh, we've, we're back to dual, dual CCT in the specialties that do, do the acute take where the amount of general medicine is high at the beginning and reduces uh, in importance as time goes on, but the specialty becomes more important as time goes on. And that most people are taking five years from the start of their ST3 job to their CCT. The, uh, the curricula for the other specialties changed in 2010, um, but so the main one is around that CMT GIM. And since 2010, the curricula have been updated on a regular basis. So we had a, a revision of core medical training again in 2011. Um, unfortunately, at that time, because in the original version, there were lots and lots of procedures in the curriculum, which uh, it would be virtually impossible for, for core trainees to do. But uh, the, the procedures was made more sensible for uh, the core medical trainees but uh, I pointed out you haven't done it for the, for the GIM trainees beyond that. We need to say what, they, what they're supposed to do procedures-wise. But the, uh, we now, ha in 2009, we had the, uh, a definite new specialty approved by the, uh, the Privy Council and, and by Parliament mm. of acute internal medicine, which has now got its own uh, CCT. Most of them train in GIM as well. So that's our JRCPTB website, which is the source of a lot of information. And our access into the specialty curricula come via that page. Um, there's a prize for anyone that can name the 29 medical specialties. We don't in Mersey actually have all 29, but we have quite a lot of them. And they range from having one trainee in medical ophthalmology to, I think we're up to 35 trainees in geriatric medicine, which is our biggest uh, specialty. And, and growing, I might say, as well. Um, I mentioned that we've got uh, the college coordinating recruitment. We now do it for 16 of the specialties. The ones that are not inside that coordinated recruitment, um, they, they are now coordinated by their lead dean. Um, most, we're, we're very pleased that this, this, this year it's been possible to interview everyone that applies to a medical specialty. Um, and that the, the value of shortlisting has been recognised as probably not worth not a worthwhile exercise. All the trainees that apply to our specialties will get a guaranteed interview so long as that their application is sat suitable. Um, the, there were some exceptions to that, and that's in the specialties that that didn't actually follow the lead of saying we'll just have a, a guaranteed interview in one deanery. So if you want to do cardiology, then you choose the deanery you want to work in and you, you, you send your first applications there. But the, the, the process is now um, standardised across the UK. In version two of our portfolio, we, we have this layout for our multi-source feedback. Um, I'm sure that most, most of you are doing some sort of 360 degree feedback in your work. And we like, well, this is one of our, the, the ways we, because the visual presentation, the information is important. So we know when we see these um, uh, slides that so long as everything's to, to the right of that uh, midpoint, we're, we're going to be reasonably happy. And the, I picked on the, a trainee's uh, MSF feedback there, in which uh, obviously the people giving feedback thought he was absolutely wonderful. Uh, we, inside our, our e-portfolio, we do actually have a, a, have a section where the curriculum is actually reproduced, or at least the syllabus element of it. And Increasingly, we ask the trainees to link their evidence that they're actually able to deal with, say, uh, the shocked patient by linking their workplace assessments to that. Um, don't, don't usually expect them to link quite as many as, as there, but, um, and we do encourage them to use reflective practice as one of the, uh, the elements of evidence. So what uh, are the big issues at the moment? Well, keeping the curricula up to date and that is now an annual process. Um, and I've mentioned about the procedures already. Um, the examination, uh, that has over the last uh, 20, 30 years had to change to keep up to date with, uh, with, with um, the changes in medicine. The actual format of the exams have changed considerably since I did it. Uh, 
and it, it, does, it has been a requirement that it maps on to the, uh, to the core medical training element of the curriculum. Uh, so it is actually the knowledge test for that. Inside the same bracket I've put SCE, which is the specialty certificate exam, which is the knowledge test that now is, exists in place for all the specialties, although they have to be large enough to be able to run this process. That doesn't, that exam only usually is once per year per specialty, but if you want to become a cardiologist, which, no, that's probably not a good idea, if you want to become a gastroenterologist, you have to pass the specialty certificate exam in that specialty. And when you finish uh, your specialty training, you now become MRCP, instead of being UK, which is the, the suffix after you've uh, finished it in core medical training, it be converts to becoming MRCP uh, gastroenterology. Academic training, there's been a lot of developments around that. Um, the, the National Institute for Health Research have, uh, um, in partnership with deaneries and with universities, have uh, set up a number of academic clinical fellowships. The ideal time to come into those is at the beginning of a core training, so you finish your foundation. You might possibly have done an academic two years in the foundation program. You, you go into an academic clinical fellowship which is guaranteed for three years, they do have a run-through promise into a specialty. Uh, we've been quite su successful with the people that have done that in the medical specialties here in Mersey and that most of them have got a research fellowship to do a PhD and we're just awaiting the f a, the, a tranche of them to come back now to clinical training with the expectation that with their PhD and with the uh, uh, high-flying work that they will actually then be our potential future academic clinical lecturers and future uh, academics. Not surprisingly, each university in the UK has been encouraged to back the places where they're strong. So in Mersey, neurology, infectious diseases, clinical pharmacology are the ones that have been the strongest uh, and that, that's where uh, um, they've been backed. But it, it does create some other challenges of programme management, which is not really something I need to worry about today. The big tension still is the, that, that tension between this increasing amount of service work but these, the trainees are there for training. And part of our role in quality management is to ensure that if somebody's supposed to be going to a hospital to get trainings, for instance, in endoscopy, that they actually do get given endoscopy lists. So we recently did a triggered visit to one of our trusts uh, where the trainee had actually been in post for, for two months and actually hadn't been to a list and was actually de-skilling in, uh, uh, in his colonoscopy skills. Whereas he was virtually ready to be signed off as competent to do colonoscopy, coming towards the end of his training and ba basically hadn't been provided with any opportunities because all of his time was taken up doing uh, uh, works dealing with sick patients on the wards. So um, I, I view that as very, very important that if people are going to a place for training that they do actually get training. Yeah, the service is important, but that's actually the responsibility of the trust, and they can't just rely on the, the training doctors to do all of that. Similarly, they need to be able to get to their teaching. At the College of Physicians, at a national level, there's obviously, you might have seen in the newspapers last week, the worries about how, how acute hospitals are dealing with the workload. There's a, there's a push to increase uh, the number of generalists, um, but that's not really defined. You very soon, uh, a future hospitals commission is going to report from the uh, Royal College of Physicians. Um, I don't know what the, uh, the recommendations are going to be, but it's probably going to go along the line of we need uh, the footprint of, uh, of the population that, are, that a big hospital serves to be uh, larger than it is at the moment, which will force an agenda of some uh, mergers and changes in the way that certain hospitals work. I think that's going to be the case. I mean, I've talked to you about trainees coming in for, say, cardiology or gastroenterology. That, that when they, people enter those specialties, they want to do their specialty. They don't necessarily want to do the general medicine, which uh, is the bread and butter of the hospitals. But that tension's got to be re reviewed. There's also worries about whether we're training too many people. It's not been an issue of medical unemployment up to now, but we have a uh, it's thought to be an oxymoron of uh, the Centre for Workforce Intelligence, uh, which is about manpower planning, which hasn't actually ever worked particularly well in the past. But the, the centre is actually having some, ef some effects now. And f it's taken oh, hundreds of years probably to realise that there are too many doctors training in London. 
and that uh, there needs to be a shift away from London to outside. So for instance, renal medicine, the number of trainees in renal medicine is 80% of the total number of consultants. Now bearing in mind that most consultants will wor have a working career of 20, 25 years, 80% of their numbers are eight. So that if there's 100 of them, there's 80 trainees. Well, that there's never, never going to be enough. Um, so there's, that's one of the specialties where the numbers are actually being cut back. But all the cuts are, are virtually all falling on London at present. Because if you get a CCT in London, will you go and take a consultant job somewhere else? No, they don't. So you probably actually need to, the, them to get their registrar job where there's actually a future need. And that's supposed to be one of the roles of the let bees in the future of, uh, of and that, that's the local education training boards, which we're going to, uh, I think, have an impact on all of us for dealing with education. Um, here in Mersey, we've, we've, we've no desire to cut our numbers. If anything, we want to increase. Uh, and one of the examples is that, that especially the acute internal medicine, 10 years ago, there were no trainees in that. Um, we now have 26 uh, people training in acute internal medicine. Um, virtually all of the jobs are funded by trusts. Uh, training the trainers is a big, big issue. GMC have actually uh, uh, got, uh, have got some stuff which is virtually finished with its consultation now, but our challenge is having time for the trainers to do their job properly. But we increasingly are insisting on that. Um, workplace assessments I can talk about afterwards if you wish. But, uh, we need our processes of reviewing that people are making satisfactory progress to be robust. The GMC are now interested in comparing the outcomes of ARCPs from one deanery to another. So core medical training in Mersey, the, out, the unsatisfactory outcomes in Mersey were, uh, we had a, our percentage of unsatisfactory outcomes along with West Midlands were worse than anywhere else in the UK last year. So that means we've got the worst doctors with the worst training programme. No. <laughs> um, first up is if you're comparing, and this, this is some of the pitfalls of the GMC's approach, if you're comparing different training programmes then you aren't necessarily comparing like with like because we know that um, if you to get a, a job in London, you, you actually have to be very competitive. So the likelihood is that you, you, you've already pre-selected a, a high-performing group in London and in Oxford, particularly if they're coming out of universities which have got a track record of, a, of good results. And, and equally, the likes of Oxford and Cambridge, the people they manage to recruit in are different from those that re are recruited into other universities. So in the league table of membership results, Liverpool is actually near the bottom of the league. In fact, only Dundee is below it. Um, and it's because that ex the exams require people to understand basic sciences, whereas the Liverpool, train, Liverpool Medical School trains people to be good doctors. So the, the exam's not measuring the same thing. But you have to pass that exam in the medical specialties. But when we looked at our outcomes in, in the Mersey Deanery School of Medicine, CMT, most of our unsatisfactory outcomes were based on examination results, but we were applying the rules properly. Another deanery actually wasn't following the national guidance on, on the decision making from ARCPs and was waving people through or actually make, making up completely different rules because they hadn't organised their programme to be able to accommodate those who needed additional training time to actually complete the, uh, the core medical training uh, time. Because although it's, a two, it's, it's viewed as a two year uh, period of training, many of our trainees will take longer. So if you haven't passed all the exams, it's not my desire to throw them on the scrap heap. And, and some people will take four years to get through stuff that other people take too. That doesn't mean to say they're not a, not a good doctor. And having invested so much time and effort, we need to keep them uh, in the system. The importance of supervisor reports is being uh, emphasised. All doctors have to face to, up to revalidation. And for trainees, uh, that is like to be embedded in the ARCP process. It's straightforward for consultants, it's straightforward for trainees. The doctors that are neither, and these are people in the locum banks, that, that's, they're, they're more challenging, but that's a, a different matter. And I know that in the, uh, in the course that you run here um, at different levels for, for medical educators, that dealing with doctors in difficulty is always a subject that uh, features high. The more experienced you are in medical education, the more of these issues you get to deal with. And uh, whereas I would have said, when I first became a consultant, I never came across such a doctor. 
nowadays I'm dealing with these all the time, but that's because I'm the, 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 the pool of people I'm dealing with is quite large and some of them have got to, um, some s s big serious issues. But I think that's enough for now. Thank you.